Okay, let's uh, start with today's lecture. I hope you're all okay. C can you hear me okay? At the back, can you hear me okay? A bit louder? Okay. Let's see, this is, oh, this is maybe, is that better? That's good? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the next lecture about Python 3. So today we'll cover uh, some more advanced things in Python 3. Uh, last time I already gave you a overview of functions and modules and packages in Python. Before I start with now classes, I just want to give you <coughs> a small extension to functions. And um, I mentioned it last time, but I just want to go a bit deeper. So I mentioned that Python functions can take a variable number of function arguments. And so an, an example is the max function. So if you call the max function in Python, you can actually pass an arbitrary number of um, parameters, and it will return the maximum, maximum number that you passed in. So here the max number, as you can see, it works for two arguments, but it also work, works for four arguments. And the way, if you want to implement something like this, the way you do that is by adding a special argument at the end with, that you prefix with a star. And that basically tells Python to, um, to yeah, uh, map everything, all the arguments that are being passed in um, to put them together into a tuple with the name args. So here now, if you call this print max function, it takes always one argument, which is the first number, and then an arbitrary number of arguments that, that is uh, being put together into a tuple with the name args. And then you can operate on these, uh, then you can operate on these arguments. So you can, for example, look at the first argument and you can loop over the second argument on all the remaining arguments that you passed in. So this is how you make functions that take an arbitrary number of, of arguments. This also works if you have keyword arguments. And in this case, you use the double star uh, prefix in the function definition. And then if you call that function with an arbitrary number of keyword arguments, so here I use the name equal, so keyword equal value, keyword equal value for the keywords. And then if you print out what the squarks is, you'll figure out that this is a dictionary that maps the keyword name to the value. So this way you can also define a function that takes arbitrary number of keyword arguments. So this is how you make a function take in arbitrary numbers. But also what is quite useful is that you return not just one value, but many values. And the way, and the way you do this, so here, for example, look at this. Imagine you write, want to write a function that returns the coordinates. And depending on which dimension you work in, it might be two coordinates or three coordinates. So here this function is, we have, we have two coordinates, x and y. And the way we can return multiple arguments is by, by just writing return <coughs> x comma y. And implicitly what happens is that you're using the short notation of creating a tuple. So really you're just returning one tuple with two components, the x and y component. But now the cool thing is if you call this function, you can unpack this tuple in this short notation as well. So you can just write my x comma my y equals coordinates and it will assign the first uh, the first value of the tuple to my x and the second value of the tuple to my y. So it's quite a short notation for returning multiple arguments, but really what's going on is that you're just packing implicitly all the arguments into tuple and then unpacking them again when you call the function. Yeah, that's all I wanted to say about multiple, multiple function arguments and multiple return values in Python functions. Okay, but moving on to new things. So today's lecture is going to be about classes. So in particular, I will talk about the syntax of classes and how we can inherit 
how we implement inheritance in Python. I will talk about special at attributes and methods that we have in Python classes, static attributes, so static functions and static class variables, and properties. Then I will mention the scoping in Python, so how long do variables live in Python, and I will also mention testing, since some students asked for this on Piazza, and it's the exercise that is currently out. Before we dig in, let's just some general updates. So the assignment three that's currently running, um, there the deadline is on Sunday. So make sure that you publish all your results uh, to GitHub. And then the next assignment, assignment four, will be published on Monday next week. And this is a three week assignment. So this is our first large assignment. Um, you will have three weeks to push the solutions to GitHub, and then we'll, there will be one week peer review, peer review system that I will explain in more detail once you've handed in the solutions. And so the topic of this first large assignment is going to be numerical Python and integration with C. So we will solve hopefully some quite large or computationally heavy problems. Okay, classes in Python. So for general tutorial, if you want to read more about Python classes, there's quite a few literature that you can read on. So first of all, the Python tutorial that you can find online has an entire chapter nine assigned to classes in Python. Then we have this Think Python book that is also available for free. The chapter 15 is covering that. Then there's a book, Effective Computation and Physics, it's in Python 2, but there's actually not so much, so much difference between Python 2 and Python 3, but it's a really nice book that I can recommend. And then there's this PDF by Hans Petter on illustrating Python by, by informatics example, and the chapter 2 also co covers classes. So um, a class, so before we talk about classes, we need to define what a class is. So a class is a prototype for an object that defines a set of attributes that characterize the object of a class. So basically, a class is um, just like a function, a recipe for creating objects. And we are very familiar in objects already because in Python, everything is an object. So even integers, and even the source code, and even the class definitions are objects in Python. So if I create an integer a equals one here, and I inspect this integer, I can see, if I open up the help, I can see that this integer object here is indeed an instance of a class called int. Okay. So even simple simple um, things like integers in Python are actually objects of classes. So every, every class can have uh, variables and functions. And you'll see much more, uh, you'll see many examples later on for this. So if you're familiar with Java or C++, Python, the Python's class structure is quite similar to the ones in Java and C++, but generally it's it's a lot easier to, and faster to do class programming in Python. And that's because all functions are virtual, so implicitly everything is virtual in Python, and it's also the only, <coughs> the only setting that you have. And also there's no differentiation between private, protected, protected and public variables, even though I will show you how we can simulate this variable, but by default everything is public in Python. And we also have single and multiple inheritance in Python. So here's an example of, our, of a first Python class. So we create a, a class called MyBase. And for this, we use this keyword class. So for a function, we use def. For a new class, we use class. Then we have the class name. And we specify from which class we want to inherit. If we don't have if you, if you just wanted to create a simple class, we can always inherit from the object, which is the most general class in Python, 
the most basic class. The next line is just like for functions, we have a doc string. So here we should document what our, what our class does. Right? And again, it's the first string after the def definition line that is interpreted as doc string by Python. And then intended, we can add functions and other ad attributes to our class. So in particular, one function that you will often see as part of a class is the constructor. And this function is called when you create a new instance of this object. And so our constructor here um, every f yeah, co takes this self object. The self is a, is a reference to the instance of the object. So when you create a class, you can inst instantiate it, and you get an, an instance of this class. And this here is called self. And then we can attach new variables to this instance. So for example, here, our, our constructor takes two arguments, i and j. And we modify this instance. We attach an i, an i uh, member to this instance. And we also attach a j member to this instance. We also can define new functions for our class. So here we have a write function. And in this function, it takes our instance again. So it's this self object here. And we can use this self, we can use this self object to access the class variables that, you, that we've defined before. So basically now when you're constructing the function, we're attaching the i and j variables and when you call write, the write function, then we get out the i and j values again and print them out to screen. And so note that all the functions that we define have this self argument here. And that's always used to access the instance of the class. So with this definition now, we have created a new type, so to speak, in Python that we can use. And that new type is now called mybase. So how do we use this type now? So first we, need to, first we need to create a new instance of this type. And the way we do that is we, we call the, the Python class name, including the two arguments that we passed here. So because our class definition here had the self, this is always being ignored, plus two additional parameters here, i and j. So when we instantiate this class, we have to provide a value for i and a value for j. And these are these two values here. And then we get an object out. Right, this, is, this is now an object that we can, that has all the class attributes that we've defined. So for example, this object has an i value. And if I printed this out, we would get the value 6. So my, my object.i takes the value, has the value 6. My object.j has the value 9. And so this is because of these two lines here. This is where we attached the i and j values to the class instance. And we can also call the function that we defined on, this, on the class. So remember when we defined the class, we defined this write function. And so now if we have an object or an instance of a class, we can call this write function and it will now print out it will now print out it will call the function and print out the i and j value of this of this instance so note when you call in class function the self argument in the declaration is always neglected so this is both true for our constructor and for the write function so both of these in the definition we had the first argument was always self, but when we actually call it, we neglect that self argument here. Okay, so this is just something to be aware of. If you have an object in Python, you can use the de keyword to extract all the attributes of that object. So for example, if my object here that I just created if I ask for all the attributes, you can see that, well, first of all, you can see that it has our user-defined attributes i, j, and write. So i and j are integers, and write is a function. So this was part of our class definition. 
But you can also see there's quite a lot of other attributes um, that Python created automatically. And I'll talk about these a bit later. But this is quite useful. This still is quite useful. If you have an object and you just want to know what can I do with this object, you can use this stir. So Python also allows us to extend additional classes. And this is done through inheritance. So if you have a class and you want to, um, a typical example is if you have a class that represents animal and you want to make a class that rep represents a specific uh, animal, for example, a cat. So you have an animal class and you have a cat class. Right? Then the cat would inherit from the animal class because it, it basically has all the attributes that an animal has, but maybe it's, it's more specialized, so a cat has more specific things as well. So here, uh, here this example is a bit more abstract. So imagine we've already written our, we've already implemented our maze, my base class, and now we want to implement a more specific my sub subclass. The way we do this is we just define a new class, but rather than writing here inheriting from object what we've done before, we now type in the name of our class here, my base. And so now we can overload the constructor. And so for here, for example, we change the number of arguments that the constructor takes. So rather than just taking two arguments, we now take three arguments. And then what we can do is we can call the, const the original constructor of our base class with this line here. And so here we need to be careful that our base class only takes two arguments. So here I only pass i and j. And then I use this self keyword again to attach to extend this class by a new attribute called k. And then I also overload the write method such that it actually prints out i, j, and k. Right. So by inheriting, we now um, yeah, we inherited um, all the functionality of the base class and we were able to extend it. And so here's an example how we can use this. So we call the constructor again, this time because our, our constructor takes three <coughs> arguments, we have to pass in three, key, three integers here. And then we can call the write method. And because we've overloaded it, if we call it now, we will see that um, we actually get the result of, with, we call this method. So this is actually a typo, this should be my sub. But you can see that we get three numbers here, i, j, and k, i, j, and k. So we indeed called the right function of the, of the subclass. Okay, so another comment on, on how Python handles object orientation. So imagine we now defined another write function that looks like this. So it just takes in an object v and it calls v.write. And then we, for example, call it on the my sub object. So there's nothing, um, nothing special going on. If we call this, we get exactly the result that we expect to see. So i, j, the values of i, j, and k. But so this is in some way special to Python because in, in, in Java and C++, defining such a fun function would be quite a bit more complicated because basically you would have to um, declare this v here. You need to, especially in Python and C++ and Java, you have to specify which type this is, that which type this object here is. And so we would basically have to declare that this v here is of my base, is a my base object. And then we would have to rely on the virtual function uh, feature in C++ and Java to call the correct write method. So in this case, if we pass in a my sub object, then it, the virtual function makes sure that we call the write method of the my sub um, attribute. But in Python, this actually, all these complications don't arise yet because in fact, you can, you can call this write method here with any type of object that as long as the object ha has a write function. 
So we don't care about the type that we pass in here as long as the, the object that we pass in has a right function. And yeah, it has to have a right function and it has to take no arguments. These are the, these are the only assumptions that we make when we pass in. Okay, any, any questions so far on classes? Everything clear? Yeah, maybe? Okay, so sometimes if you have, if you have an object, um, it's often quite useful to test if that object is of a specific class. So maybe you want to uh, throw an error if a user passes an object to a function and it's of the, if, if it's of the wrong type or it's, if it's not of the right, correct class. And so here's the way you do that. So you call this is instance keyword with the object as the first argument and the class that you want to test is the second argument. And now if that object is, is, uh, is an object of the class my sub, then this will return true and otherwise it will return false. You can also check if a class is a subclass of another. So remember we defined a subclass my sub and a base class my base. And so if we call this is subclass with these two arguments, then it will return true because my sub is indeed a subclass of my base. If we swapped around these two arguments, then it would return false because my base is not a subclass of my sub. And then we can also, given if we have two objects and we want to check if they're the objects of the same class, we can also do that. So we can extract, given an object inst1, we can extract its class with this underscore, underscore class, underscore, underscore. The same thing we do for the ins, for, for our second object inst2. And then we use the key, this is keyword to compare the two. And if they're the same, then we will indeed go into this if statement, otherwise uh, we won't. So this magic with this um, magic uh, function underscore this class underscore underscore returns the class of the object my object. Right? So if you have an if you have an object, you can also you can always get its class. Okay. So. Often it's quite useful to have private or non-public uh, data in a class. So this is maybe you're writing a very complicated class with a lot of internal details that the user is not really supposed to see. And then it's quite useful to just make all these internal variables and functions that you declare private or non-public so that the, that the user doesn't see or doesn't need to see it. But in, in in Python classes, such a concept doesn't actually exist. So in principle, we can always, there's no technical way of preventing users from uh, calling all the, fun all the functions in a class of, of an object and all the attributes of a function. And we can even manipulate the data and the methods in an object. So for example, we had this my object dot y, we had this my object, and if we call my object, dot white, then we would get this my base i equals six and j equals nine. But now what I can do is I can just use the an assignment call here and just overwrite that function, the original write function, by a little lambda function here that I defined here. And then if I call this my object again, then I lost my original write function and I changed, I replaced it by this I don't care function. So, um, as you can see, this, um, this op my object, you can basically do whatever you want with it. But there are some conventions that you can follow if you want to use private or non-public data. So if in a class, if you create a name, so this could be a variable or a function name that starts with a simple with a single underscore, these are treated in Python by, uh, as a non-public or protected uh, functions. And the way you 
the way this becomes vis visual visible is, for example, if you ask for the documentation of that function, then typically these are just excluded. But if you know the name of this, then you can still access it and you can still change it. If you have a name that starts with a um, with sorry, with a double underscore, so two underscores, then these names are considered strictly private. And the way this becomes visible is that Python actually mangles the, the method name or the variable name. And it, it, tend, it depends the class name to it. So if you created a variable, a class variable with underscore underscore sum, then later on when you want to access it, you, this doesn't actually exist anymore, but it's now called underscore class name underscore underscore sum. So uh, this, yeah, this way it becomes uh, more difficult to abuse these internal variables. And then we have a third convention, and these are names that start and end with double underscores. And these are special methods and attributes that I will discuss later. But let's, I want to show an example of these first two, of these non-public and these strictly private examples, uh, variables. So here we have a class. I have a constructor of this class. And here I create a class variable that starts with the name underscore a and I just assign it to false. Then I have another variable that just has a normal name, so this is a public one. And then finally, I have another, a third class variable that starts with a double underscore C, and this is, the, so this is the private function. And finally, I can also make, the same thing also works for functions, right? So if I make a class function that starts with a double underscore, again, this is a private function. And so now I can Instantiate that class, I can access the underscore a, so this is my uh, non-public variable. I can access my public variable, of course, so this all works. But now, this under underscore c doesn't exist anymore. Instead, if I want to access it, I need to call underscore my class underscore under c. In the same way, I can't just call the hidden function. Instead, if I really wanted to call it, I have to call the m dot underscore my class underscore underscore hidden function. So this is the way you can hide functions from from the user. Yeah, and obviously we can again if you use our dir our dir function here, we can see what Python has done. It has changed the names of our attributes in that function. While underscore a and b, they're the same. But this underscore underscore c and underscore underscore hidden, they're now uh, renamed. OK, let's talk about special attributes. So mm, when we, let's look again at our two classes that we've defined, this base class and this subclass. Let's create two instances of these and let's look at the attributes that these classes have. And as you can see, we, have, we had the ones that we've defined by the user, but there was a lot of other attributes that start with this underscore, underscore, name, underscore, underscore. And these are so-called special attributes in Python. And they, as the name indicates, they have um, a special meaning. So let's try some out. So we have this my object here, and it has this special attribute underscore underscore dict underscore underscore. So if we, if we call this, what we get is I, we get the um, a dictionary with I and the I value and J and the J value. And if we call this for the instance of the subclass, then we get i, j, and k. So what we can conclude from that is that this special dict member function returns a dictionary of the user-defined class variables. So because our base class had the class variables i and j, and our subclass had, had i, j, and k. So this underscore you can use if you want to get a list of class variables. 
Another one that we've already seen is this underscore underscore class underscore underscore. So this special attribute returns the returns the class of that object. And again, as everything, classes are just objects in Python again. So this is just another object here that represents the class and uh, the class again you can uh, has magic functions, uh, has these special functions and so on that you can use the same way. So for example, the class has a special attribute called name. And if you extract the class and then extracts the class name, then you get a string with the name of the class. And this name special, uh, special attribute also works for functions. So remember our my sub class had a write function, and if we call the special attribute name, then we get a string of the name of that function. Okay, so these special methods, all the special methods in Python, they, they, they re, they, uh, the way you recognize them is that they start and end with double underscores. And the reason why they're so useful is because they are automatically, Python calls them automatically when you do certain operations. For example, if you take an object and you call this str on it, so str just means convert me the object into a string representation, really what's happening is that Python calls the special, the special attribute of a called underscore underscore string underscore underscore. And yeah, so basically string a works for all objects that have these underscore underscore string underscore so inter implemented. And this is for example also being used when you print out an object. So when you print out an object in Python, it internally calls this string method to convert the object into a string representation and that string representation is then printed out to screen. So the same thing, for example, if you ask for the length of an object. What this hap internally what happens is that Python calls the underscore underscore len underscore underscore function and then returns the value that that function um, yeah, returns. So, yeah. And so this works for all these things. So for example, if you take two, if you multiply two objects internally, what happens is that the mul function is being called for one of the, for the a instance. If you add two instances, the add function is called, and so on and so forth. So for example, if you, yeah, uh, here is the indexing notation. Mm. Here you can even, here is the call notation. So here, a is an, a is an object and you just pretend like it's a function and you call it with some arguments. And then what happens, Python calls the underscore underscore call underscore underscore fu special function. It also checks for Boolean if you want to convert it if something is true or false or for comparisons. So the reason why this is important is because if you, if you implement your own class and you want users, people who use your class, to also be able to use any of these, uh, any of this notation here, then basically what you, the only thing you need to do is that you need to implement these special functions, right? So if you want your user to be able to, to multiply an object of your class by, uh, by a number or so, then you just implement this mul function, you define what should happen with your class when, it, when it's multiplied by, by a number, and then this syntax will suddenly work. Or if you want to define, if you make, want to make your class accessible to this index notation, then you just need to implement this underscore underscore get item or, and underscore underscore set item functions. And then it will automatically support that. So there's a lot more of these special functions that you can implement and a full list is uh, shown here in this Python reference data model link down here. So I want to show an example how why, why this is so useful. So imagine, 
imagine we have a function uh, x. We imagine we have a function that takes an x and y value, but it also takes three additional parameters a, b, and c. So in total, our function takes x, y, a, b, and c, and then it does some computations and returns the value. But now suppose that we need to we want to send this function into another function called quit values. And what this quit values does is it does some computations. Uh, it, it does it defines a loop, so it loops over all the x coordinates and all the y coordinates, and then it calls this f function. So we're passing f f here. This is actually a function, so we can call f here. But instead of passing all the five arguments, it only pa it only uses two arguments here. Okay. So just like we've written it down here, this won't work because f, expe f expects five arguments, but here we're only passing two arguments. And so such a scenario happens actually quite often um, if, if grid values, if this function grid values here might be somewhere in an external library that, you've, uh, that you just import maybe. But um, yeah, and you might not, you, typically don't want to change the library just because you have a different function set up here. So how can we, how can we match this so that, it, uh, so that this will, will still work? So here's one idea. One idea is that we use global parameters. So we could just go ahead and say, well, maybe it's not so important. I can just change the function definition of f so that it only takes x and y, so now I only take two parameters, and then the remaining ones, a, b, and c, I just rely on global parameters. Um, yeah. So this will work, so I can define these global parameters, a, b, and c, set some values, and then call quit values uh, with, with f, and now the signature of f matches with what, what quit values expects. But the disadvantage is that, or the problem is that, these global parameters are typically uh, considered evil. So if you have too many global parameters in your program, then uh, it's often a, a sign that the program is not so well structured, and there can be quite subtle bugs happening when you have too many global variables. So maybe, maybe that's not such a good idea after all. OK, so here's another idea. We can, so Python allows us to sp specify default arguments. So why don't we just go ahead and change our function definition f here so that it takes, so that a, b, and c are just optional arguments, and we write the numbers in here, the numbers that we want. And then again, we can call f with just two arguments. So we can just pass it into good values, and again, this will work. But of course, the problem now is that this is useful if we know exactly what a, b, and c is. But if we want to change these a, b, and c values, then we're stuck again because we hard coded the default values in the function definition. So we, just, we can't just change it. So again, maybe that's, maybe that's not the ideal situation that we want. But of course, with classes, everything gets better. So the solution is that we create a new class and we implement this call operator. And by doing so, an instance of this class will act just like a normal function. So even, even though it's an, it's, a, it's an instance of an object, we can make it behave like it's just a function. So the, the strategy that we use now is that we make all the parameters, so this a, b, and c parameters, we make these class attributes, and then we implement the special call function so that the, func so that the class instance behaves like a normal function. So here's our implementation. So we have this class, I just called it capital F here, uh, we don't need any inheritance, so I just inherit from our base class object, the 
Python baseless object. Then I implement a constructor function. This constructor, constructor function takes our parameters. So here A, B, and C. And I can choose default parameters here or not. This doesn't really matter. And I store, I save all these three parameters as class variables. So this is in these three lines, self dot a equals a, self dot b equals b, and self dot c equals c. So now these ABC parameters are attached to any class instance. And so now the last thing, the second step is to implement the call function. And the way I do that is um, I define the call function and I want the call function to take in two arguments, x and y, okay? And then when I call this function, I just implement my, my formula here. And now note that when I, def when I access the parameters, I use self.a, self self.b, and self.c, because a, b, and c are here class variables. And so now, if I create an instance of my class, I call it little f, I can now specify which parameters a, b, and c should have. And because I specified default parameters, I can even leave out some. And this instance now, I can now pretend as, as it was if I can now use f just if it was a function. So I can write f 0 0.1 and 2. And internally, what will now happen is that it will call this call function here, compute this expression here and return its value, and then the value stored in B. So even though f is here really an instance of an object, it just, it just behaves like a normal function. And so this means I can also just pass it into the quit values and it will work. So this is one, one application where these uh, special classes uh, become really useful. Okay, so let's take a 15 minute break and let's start again at quarter past.